All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. <laughs> Do you know me from email? I'm Liz Carlisle. I'm the coordinator of the Diversified Farming Systems Roundtable. And our faculty leaders of the Diversified Farming Systems Working Group are Claire Clement and Esther Isles. And Alistair is introducing today, so I'm going to read his introductory remarks. Welcome everyone to the second round of the Diversified Farming Systems and Multifunctional Agriculture Speed Talks. Today we have a very full but exciting program of speakers. The panels include Making Policies for Diversified Farming Systems Multifunctional Agriculture, Linking Diversified Farming Systems and Multifunctional Agriculture with Social Systems, Assessment for Diversified Farming Systems and Multifunctional Agriculture, and Diversified Farming Systems Multifunctional Agriculture in the Global South. One goal of our talk series is to see what research people are doing or are hoping to do in this field across campus. We were very pleased with the talks last time and we're looking forward to learning more from everyone. And then just a couple of administrative announcements from me. We have a couple speakers who can't be here. Kim Talbear had a family funeral in South Dakota, so she wasn't able to make it. And Jason Corburn had a childcare issue. But we're lucky to have Jesse Williamson from Environmental Science Policy Management to take up the urban food part uh, that we're going to talk about uh, in our second panel. And then uh, in terms of the timing, I'm going to be the timekeeper. So I will be holding up this sign. And you have one minute remaining for those of you who are speaking. And I'll be back there behind the camera. <laughs> and for those of you who haven't been by the table, we have the schedule for the day, and we also have the release forms for those of you who are speaking so that we can post this video on our website. So without further ado, we're going to start with Alistair. <laughs> who will be keeping tabs on himself. <laughs> All right. As a resident environmental policy expert, I'll focus today on policies to support the retention or revival of diversified farming systems in industrial countries like the United States. There are many potential policies that we could experiment with to achieve this goal, ranging from reallocating subsidies to diversified farming systems, reforming regulation to internalize the full environmental impacts of industrial agriculture, changing agricultural extension to promoting market-based certification. These policies, however, remain ill-defined and aren't well integrated in the science underlying diversified farming systems. This lack of integration alone warrants much more attention. Two specific examples of what I would like to work on are as follows. First, I want to investigate the degree to which policies can encourage the development of greater diversification on farms and in farming regions. How can farmers be motivated to change or keep their land use and growing practices so that, for example, pollinators can thrive in the sort of landscapes that Claire is looking at? Should this happen through setting rules for the provision of vegetation that are enforced against farmers? or through rewarding farmers with economic incentives, or by creating peer pressure across social networks? How can motivations be better linked to the science of agroecology? How can we evaluate the effectiveness of different types of policies? A related fundamental problem is that of achieving transitions to diversified farming systems. If farmers are trying to switch to diversified farming systems, they face many risks, such as succumbing to failures while learning to diversify. Motivating farmers also entails equipping them with the resilience needed to adopt diversified farming systems. Second, I'm very interested in policies for creating or retaining the knowledge shock needed to practice diversified farming systems, which is very knowledge intensive compared to industrial agriculture. To be able to grow multiple crops and varieties and to connect crops and livestock together, farmers need expertise that is adapted to their dynamic global conditions. Much of this expertise may be traditional, but it's not static because modern technologies can be integrated in too. For example, in the Appalachia region, there are many fruit growing practices and varieties that are quickly being lost as older generations of farmers die out. Currently, the research and development system favors monocultures and petrochemical inputs, rather than doing research into how different forms of knowledge could be used to sustain diversity. Policies could include developing knowledge banks to preserve existing knowledge, developing tools and training processes around peer-to-peer -peer networks, and promoting what's known as citizen science. Patrick Bauer will work with me on this R&D question next fall. I can explore these research interests on my own. 
They need the collaboration of many others. For example, ecologists who can help inform the science, anthropologists or sociologists who can unpack existing knowledge, economists who can provide insight into the influence of incentives. In short, diversified farming system policies cut across what everyone is doing to varying degrees. Thank you. I normally was with David Zimmerman talking since I saw him <laughs> with Annie Shannon. Um, she's going to talk about food policy councils. So I am a first year PhD student in the geography department, and I'm also a fellow at Food First, the Institute for Food and Development Policy in Oakland where for the past two years prior to coming here, I was a policy analyst. A lot of my work centered around municipal and local food policies, and specifically food policy councils. And just quick show of hands, who's heard the term food policy councils in here? So, quick overview, food policy councils advisory boards to local governments. They're tasked with studying the food system in its entirety and coming up with policy solutions, usually at the local, county, and sometimes there's even state food policy councils, um, that can kind of bring different actors across the food system together for creative solutions. So they've done everything from simple tasks like rerouting bus lines for low-income neighborhoods that maybe aren't serviced by grocery stores to have easier access to full-service grocery, to doing things like building affordable housing for farm workers, encouraging farm-to-school programs, helping develop marketing boards so local farmers can access institutional buyers in the city. Um, wildly creative institutions. So I finished a study about a year ago with a bunch of co-authors looking at, we interviewed 48 different food policy councils for nuts and bolts. What's your structure? What's your relationship to government? How do you make decisions? What does that allow you to do? Do you focus on policy? Do you run programs? Um, and that produced two reports, 150 pages of documentation. One of them came out last year, one of them will be out in about two months. And the project I'm sort of working on now, um, with just a little toe in the water of it, is specifically trying to address the issue of setting up a food policy council and what are those really important structural choices that need to be made. Um, the USDA and the Center for Disease Control, along with some private foundations, have been increasing funding to food policy councils in the last couple of years, and there's a lot of new councils springing up around the country. Um, in Oakland, the Oakland Food Policy Council made a really conscious decision to, and Nathan here can probably talk a lot more about it than I can if you're interested afterwards, to make sure that all the different sectors of the food system were represented, that the Oakland Food Policy Council reflected the diversity of Oakland, and that there were really transparent structures for decision making and priority setting, and that took a real long time. It took well over, what, two years to get that all together before the first recommendations were able to be made, and that's a really much longer time horizon than a lot of funders are interested in supporting. Um, so this sort of new project building on that work is kind of a side project of mine. Um, I'd like to kind of synthesize some of that information from the interviews about the nuts and bolts, how do food policy councils work, what kind of structures make them work best, and pair that with case studies, doing a little bit of follow-up on some of the interviews from new councils, and then talking in depth about what that careful attention to decision-making structure has enabled the open food policy council to do. Right. <laughs> Thank you, Annie.
Generally, there is a really long, long literature on agricultural policy and political economy of agriculture, and I really, in two minutes, I'd like to summarize. The, almost every government has an objective to have cheap food. So a lot of agricultural policy was about getting cheap food. That's objective number one. And I think what happened is that food became very cheap over time, especially in developed countries. And then there was another objective, which is to support farmers. So we really built the system that on one hand we have research and development and increase their productivity, and the other hand we have subsidies to farmers. Now, the reason that we needed to have subsidies for farmers is to see. First, demand for agriculture is inelastic, so if you have a little bit too much, if you have too much supply, suddenly prices go down. And secondly, the high rate of technological change was such that prices went down all the time. But then it resulted in some negative side effect, which is when prices of the subsidies basically figure in the price of land, and now a lot of time people use agricultural commodities not so much to help farmers to deal with poverty, but rather to maintain the wealth and maintain the value of agricultural land. Okay? So that's one thing. That we have a set of policies that is really uh, problematic because the objective of protecting farm, in farm income, this is the US, has been accomplished. The second thing that uh, people realize is that in addition to having cheap food and uh, wealth to farmers, there is another objective, which is the objective of environmental uh, quality. So what really happened in the last 20, 20 or 30 years, which I think was good, is people introduced all these policies that, call the, that are the CRP, Conservation Reserve Program, etc. Now, when these policies were introduced, they were basically a support policies in disguise. And the challenge that we have in the last several years is to identify environmental criteria that are real, so these policies will basically be used to really to support new stuff that is meaningful, to support different type of farming, etc. And I think that the big challenge that we have in a diversified farming system is to develop criteria that you can basically agree that it's scientifically verifiable and uh, agreeable in the same way that other criteria were developed in the CRP. Think what happened in the CRP to move from land subsidy to, to a program that I to deal with water quality, air pollution, uh, soil erosion, and now start to look at biodiversity. I think one of the big challenges is to introduce criteria that will provide incentive uh, to biodiversity. And a lot of the other element that the way that you farm will, get, it will be supported as long as you can justify it scientifically. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a tough uh, struggle, but in the in, in historical time, it, in my view, it was very fast, much faster than people said. The other thing that I think is very important is that there is the issues of educating uh, consumers, okay, I know, educating consumers and develop policies that basically will make sure that consumers are really aware of the choices. And in this regard, all the issues that relate to obesity and policies that deal with obesity are very important. Now, the third thing that I think is really the most important one is to make the diversified farming system a key element of the, of, of the research establishment. Because up to now, almost all the changes in US agriculture were a result of public research. And to me, today, public research to a large extent is captured by a lot of the big farm, traditional, uh, farming systems, and I think that, that, that really uh, is a fact. Now, what is the caveat? I really think that when it comes to diversified fa farming system, it's important to be inclusive, to look at the diversified farming system, not necessarily as organic, but to look at a lot of great. Uh, as I said before, a big challenge is to, to introduce, to move away from a chemical system to another system, and to be able to introduce, to combine practices with advanced genetics. If that would be uh, happen together, we can build a coalition that will change the way that, uh, that the way that research in the US is operating. 
Now, the one thing that people, one thing, one thing that people uh, are eluding themselves, I think that diversified farming system will develop its own agribusiness and it will be big business. That one thing, and that doesn't matter how you do it, that's what will happen. That always what happened. Slow food is still a big business. So to some extent, the issue is not the business aspect, the issue is the substance. To develop an agricultural system that is more diversified and is more green and to tend the research establishment to it to encourage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. farming system will have a lot of ecological implications, uh, it will improve lifestyle. Uh, you may find that through businesses you will have, for example, what happened in Taiwan, a situation that older people will be involved in agriculture. But I think from the nature of, uh, because it's more, let's say, because organic is more risky than uh, traditional farming, people in organic generally in Europe tend to be richer and have bigger farm and have bigger capacity to uh, deal with risk. So I think if you look at it as a solution to solve world countries problem, I don't think that that's a solution. We can take another question and then come back around to that one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, are there any other questions out there? 
And maybe you can just briefly talk on this. We've had conversations about this, but um, mm -hmm. in terms of the some of the more structural issues that food policy councils might address beyond simply like getting um, uh, food stamps accepted at farmers markets and sort of these like little small things, what kinds of structural issues might did you come across with it, with your research? Well, I mean, it depends on how you define structural, but. Some food policy councils, like the Cleveland Cuyahoga Food Policy Council, has really progressive urban ag policies that include five-year low-cost leases on city-owned public land for entrepreneurial gardens and community gardens. It also includes flat rate water, so you can literally hook your irrigation up to a fire hydrant, have really low-cost flat rate water, and the zoning is such that one can sell his or her produce right on the city lot. So that's enabled between 40 and 50 new community gardens and entrepreneurial urban ag ventures. Um, you know, locally owned food businesses essentially to start in the last year there. And food policy councils have also done things like the Maryland Food Systems Group in the late 90s wanted to run a big anti-hunger campaign in the state. Um, and they went and interviewed all these different food banks sort of about how to run such a campaign. And food banks said actually all, almost all of our clients have jobs, they're working. Um, it's not unemployment, it's not hunger, it's low wages, and so the Food Policy Council actually got into a minimum wage fight at the state level. So, there's two examples. <coughs> yeah? I'm just curious, uh, David, about, because this came up on Monday in the seminar in, in the SPM, and then there's Pam Ronald and Davis pushing this idea that organic has to marry biotechnology. Okay. What, what, what is it that it has to do that? Uh, because, I did some studies recently that show that with all the problems that we have with GMO, without GMO, the food, food prices of food will be about 40 to 50 percent higher. Is there, is there one hectare of GMO that are killing people right now? Yes. Okay. No, 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 the, the, point is, the point is this, you know, people in China that eat, that they will eat uh, meat regardless of uh, what you and me say. There are people that are kind of around. No, 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 but the problem is this, what happened, we have a food system for better or for worse that uh, generally people that can, that can pay eat. And today China, India, and Asian countries are eating, and Haiti and other countries are suffering. So when the price of food is going up, yeah, is, is rising, people are suffering. And what happened is you want to know people in China and other countries have more income and they want to eat food. In the same way that a lot of people in America feed their pet but other people are eating. That's the system. We can change the system, that's something else. But given the existing system that we have now, the only way that you deal with uh, hunger is that you produce food. And GMO already, by producing uh, alfalfa, uh, uh, allowing to produce alfalfa in Argentina, has much bigger impact on the, fight of, uh, on the price of food by reducing it down than, uh, than by food. Second, the GMO can actually increase uh, biodiversity because it's nothing wrong with it, it's basically using, taking advantage of a lot of the advanced technologies that we have today to replace pesticides. There was the NFC report, I don't know if you read it recently, that showed that the GMO reduced toxicity in food and basically saved life. So to some extent, it's a new scientific development that we as scientists can shape it. You cannot basically throw away the knowledge that we have of genetic and the DNA because you don't like it. I see it is in the same way that people didn't like electricity and electronic because they didn't understand what's going on inside the now inside the same. My question, why do you want to marry it with organic? Oh, oh no, because if most organic, organic is so great, no, no, why no. do you need organic? No, 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 that's not the point. The point is this, that what happened is once you say that we will take because because the point is that there are evidence. See, okay, if someone wants to pay for organic the way that organic is, it is cost. But at the same time when you have low yield, it takes more acres and you start having a lot of problems. I think one of the biggest challenges is how you save the, uh, biodiversity, how to reduce the food, uh, the food, uh, the footprint on agriculture, and how you make the system more sustainable. Now, I think that organic is nice, but I think that if you really want to feed six or seven billion people and you don't select some of them to go away, you need to have as much food as you can in a as no, more environmentally sound way that you they can. Not every GMO is great. There are a lot of organic practices that are for the better, but you cannot constrain your technology to one thing because the net effect is that you will reduce 
you're angry and you will freeze your life. You cannot tell people not to feed themselves and cut a trees in the forest because they want to go one way. So in my view, try to take all the techniques that are environmentally sound and put them together rather than say this is good and this is bad. And so now my my feeling is that I think we have an artificial fight within academia between one group and another, and I think we have to live all together. And I think we can all basically develop a system that is both sustainable and environmentally sound. That 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 was the thing that said part of the research. Thank you very much. Um, I think Alan maybe is ready to respond to the previous question. So maybe Lisa, can you read out Alistair's response? Mm -hmm. So the range of policies I mentioned have a mix of uh, governmental and community funding. Most of the, uh, the, the policies surrounding DFS are governmental, so Uh, the taxpayer pays in the end. Um, subsidies are also governmental in nature. The challenge is that these funding sources are still largely based on industrial agriculture. We need to work on ways to shift the funding to DFS for the farmer. Um, it was mentioned that even more Of knowledge, the knowledge area is more <coughs> scattered because there's currently no cohesive system for maintaining this knowledge. Um, it falls onto the undersourced farmer and community groups that Anna discussed. We need to change this. Mm -hmm. Okay, one sure. sure. I think that the key point with DFS is to move away from agricultural policies to landscape policies. There will be much more cuts. If you look at it at the local area, then if regions would like to preserve a certain ecological look, then if you try to justify it by uh, competing in U.S. art policies, U.S. art policies are going to die. There is a lot of pressure against them. On the other hand, there is a lot of pressure to, to maintain lifestyle and to, develop a, a, and, and to develop a lot of green pockets around the country. So I really think that a lot of time, fighting at the local level and different communities with uh, a lot of uh, group like the Nature Conservancy will be much more effective than fighting uh, basically a shrinking by the USDA. Thank you. Okay, well, I think we're out of time for this particular panel. So um, thank you to the
uh, producers. And these are often the farmers who consider themselves to be you know, legitimate real bananeros in contrast to their agroforestal counterparts who are operating on more marginal land in the Andean foothills. Uh, they combine banana cultivation with other agricultural and tree crops, sometimes livestock or animal pasture. And they have limited infrastructure, and use limited, limited inputs, and operate primarily with household labor. Um, as most of you are probably aware, agroforestry is really seen as this paradigm of multifunctional agriculture. Um, however, my research suggested in the context of competitive market pressures, agroforestal practices have come to be seen as problematic by its cooperative professional staff and the more productive monocropping farmers. First, agroforestal members can't, uh, they have to, the most difficulty meeting the requirements that are increasingly associated with export agriculture, infrastructure, phytosanitary requirements, all the kinds of certifications that are necessary to sell in European and coming soon U.S. supermarkets. They are also more generally resistant to altering their production for a variety of reasons that are not time to talk about. Um, and I just want to give you one example to illustrate the tension. In 2009, the cooperative's professional staff and um, more productive members who dominate the leadership decided to impose a minimum quota, uh, 50 boxes per week. And with that in perspective, it, that's a quantity that would require at least one hectare of land under the best possible monoculture conditions. Um, in order to even try and meet these quotas, then the agroforestal farmers are really being pushed into um, practices that are going to undermine in the long term, and even in the short term, their ecological and economic sustainability, including reduced crop diversity to make way for more bananas. Uh, substitution of off-farm inputs for crop rotation and other soil building uh, practices, increased debt to finance all of this, as well as to you know to implement the infrastructure that's needed, as well as increased labor demand. It's being absorbed right now primarily within the household, although the, the movement is really towards clearly towards you know labor higher labor situations. And um, at the time of my research, 172 of these uh, 431 active co-op members were not meeting this minimum. So this is a story of market pressure undermining socio-ecological sustainability. That's certainly nothing new. However, I think that what's notable here is that this is in fair trade, um, a market that is supposedly buffered and um, kind of goes against all of the claims made by you know, fair trade folks about uh, you know, sustainability. And in fact, the farmers who are being the most marginalized are sort of cl most closely resemble this fetishized agrarian ideal that uh, is really rampant in fair trade. So I just want to conclude by saying I'm a social scientist. I went into this looking uh, for a story about the role of fair trade in mediating labor relations and labor processes. And I, it hadn't really occurred to me to question fair trade's environmental claims. Um, so this is part of a broader project. I'm really focused on, on the social relations of, of production here. But I do believe that having seen this now and how, how clearly this is affecting agroforestry in, within at least fair trade bananas, that um, it really calls for more sustained and, and systematic interdisciplinary research. So after I finish my dissertation, I'm looking for partners. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So I'm actually uh, stepping in for Jason Corbett, and he was going to talk about uh, uh, the people's market in West Oakland. So I will touch on that briefly, and I'll try to tie it into the larger research that I'm looking at. Um, so West Oakland has been, uh, areas in West Oakland have been designated as food deserts by some studies, meaning they're not served by a supermarket that's within walkable distance. So a lot of the people in these areas don't have access to fresh, healthy food at an affordable price. They have to go to corner stores that don't have organic, they pay more money for the food that they buy, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Is anybody unfamiliar with the term food desert? Okay. So, uh, so people's grocery in West Oakland tried to address this um, by having an urban agricultural project that they would distribute through this community support agricultural project. They distribute it through grub boxes. They have a tiered pricing system. Um, they do community ally training. So they have a lot of social programs to try to address the issue of a lack of affordable, healthy food in West Oakland. Um, 
they have tried to step it up a level, and Brown Mahdi, the former executive director of, uh, of People's Grocery, has moved on to try to start a grocery store based on the model that People's Grocery started. Um, a couple of years ago, I talked with him uh, before I got into this program, and I actually went in high school for a while, so I sort of slipped out of the research for a bit. But what he was looking at at that point was ways that some of these smaller grocery stores, especially coming from communities that lack the, the infra, uh, the, um, the capital that somebody like a Kroger's chain, which is also trying to come into West Oakland, is able to come in with a large, you know, big box store, a lot of resources. Um, Brown Lottie wanted to see how can a smaller scale store utilize social capital, alternative models to provide services through this store for the local community that would make it as attractive as a Whole Foods or a Kroger's or whatever um, with the bigger capital, but providing these things through social capital, such as nutrition services or massage therapist, or these things you tend to see in some of these big places. Um, they're trying to make it much more convenient, basically, to get the kind of food uh, that um, people in these communities are lacking. So in terms of addressing the social equity issue of lack of access to food, um, there are obviously a number of things going on in terms of addressing food deserts, in terms of uh, putting together food policy councils, larger infrastructural questions. Um, I do actually have, I, I didn't get to ask it, but I am, Curious as to find out what the communicational infrastructure between these food policy councils are, how they share their data and information, and uh, their best practices. Um, I know I'm probably running low on time, so I just wanted to address three sort of larger issues that are that are coming into my research and connect to this. So first is the binaries we often see arise in here. Guys, give a show of hands really quickly. How many people in here would consider themselves physical scientists, social scientists? Neither. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. So I didn't see any hands from physical scientists. And this is kind of my point. This is one of those binaries. We've got social science versus physical science. Uh, we've got rural versus urban. We've got traditional ecological knowledge versus uh, conventional green revolution, quote unquote, uh, modernist approach to agriculture. We've got public versus private. All of these things can be bridged. And, and connecting to what Alistair was saying earlier, I think it's going to be the combination of technologies, the combination of approaches and knowledges that end up producing some of the best solutions to these problems. So this is an example of bringing these together. In the case of rural versus urban, you've got peri-urban production, which could be considered sort of rural, sort of urban. It, it balances the two. What are the differences between a purely urban environment and a purely rural environment? Can we leverage some of the advantages of both? Just as an example of how to bridge these binaries. Uh, traditional ecological knowledge versus conventional approaches. Um, fantastic book, Zapotec Science by Robert Gonzalez. And in it, he talks about the fact that milpa, which is a, a, a combination of beans, corn, and squash, when grown together, if using small amounts of fertilizer, of, of sort of conventional fertilizer, not the amounts that cause soil degradation or nitrogen runoff or these kind of things, but small amounts can actually produce a superior yield in a, in a milpa crop compared to what they would have gotten otherwise or compared to what they would have gotten if they had monocropped each of these things individually. And so you get the superior outcome by the combination of these two kinds of knowledges that had you focused entirely on one or the other, you wouldn't have gotten and maybe you would have never seen. Uh, and then finally, public and private. Growing power in Milwaukee, uh, Will Allen, he um, has an amazing program going on. They move millions of pounds of compost. They have these extremely large training programs, but they get a huge amount of foundation support. Um, so, but and at the same time, they've also got programs like what People's Grocery is trying to do. And so, you see this kind of, we don't have to assume that it has to pass a market test or that it's going to be entirely foundational funding. There are ways to leverage both at the same time that I think we need to look into. Um, cut it? Okay. <laughs> wow, let's try to move really fast. Scale and labor. Those are my last two. But scale and uh, where are the people going to come from? Where are they going to live? I'll address that next time. In the fall, maybe. <laughs> Thank you, Jesse. Um, next we have Justin Machere, who's going to talk about, he's an uh, associate professor in ESPA, the role of diversified farming systems in smallholder responses to drought and flood in West Africa. Sorry. I'm going to use four minutes of my time just getting my screen up. This is what I get for doing PowerPoint. But, um, thank you. So this is a very much a preliminary um, summary of some work that um, we've actually been doing for a while now. 
But I should say it's also an example of what happens when someone who's trained as an animal ecologist really tries to venture into the world of socioeconomics. Um, and uh, you can see that over there. So as, a, as an ecologist, of course, um, and any ecologists in the room are very familiar with much of the work and the long history of the uh, idea that diversity uh, begets stability in ecological systems. And of course, this was a major and foundational contribution of Robert MacArthur quite uh, more than 50 years ago. And the, the concept there, of course, is that in an ecological system, if we take a consumer, which is indicated by this red dot, that this consumer is more likely to experience stability or have greater resilience when it relies on many different resources, let's say prey or food resources in this particular case. As those uh, links between those resources are lost, our consumer becomes reliant through uh, relatively few strong interactions on a select number of resources, and thus this consumer is much more vulnerable to uh, a total loss of food or total loss of resources in the case of shocks, let's say, environmental catastrophes or climate change or other things. Now this is uh, in a, a sort of a very, still a very active area of research within ecology, but if you kind of squint your eyes and go along with me, you can also say that this same idea fits very well the livelihoods approach in economics. And that approach, or that idea, is that if we take, instead of a consumer, if we take the household, and we think about the multiple and diverse array of resources on which a household depends, and let's think about the types of capital on which a household depends, and that could be social capital, physical capital, economic capital, natural capital, and all of these things, then we start to imagine a household that is either gaining uh, resilience through multiple links, that is safety nets, if you will, is a household that's able to move among different resources in times of hardship, or a household that has relatively, is, is strongly reliant on relatively few resources and thus vulnerable to shocks. And in fact, this is what the Nobel Prize winning economist Amartya Sen put forward and is sort of, I, I would say, the pioneer of the livelihoods approach. Um, and again, there's Robert MacArthur, and I would wager that these two have never been on a slide together before. <laughs> who knows? I'm probably flattering myself. So we're pursuing this uh, type of approach in, in northern Ghana. We're looking at more than 300 um, smallholder households. And we're not just looking at agriculture. Our interest is we do a monthly sur household surveys. We've done this since 2004. And our goal is to understand all of, these, the, the, all of these different reliances, if you will, on these different forms of capital, um, from social, physical, uh, and, and particularly natural. We're very interested in how what happens, let's say, uh, with the rise and fall of crops or other resources affects people's reliance on wildlife and other natural products. It's all a dynamic system. We're trying to encapsulate that by following uh, these 300 plus households in northern Ghana through time. Uh, within the agricultural realm, of course, we're looking at diversity of crops, we're looking at intercropping, um, and we're looking, for, for example, at the relationship between those who rely heavily on very uh, commercial crops. They've had people come in uh, from the outside um, and foster, or in some cases, a lobby hard for uh, heavy reliance on commercial crop, versus other individuals in the same communities who are adopting more of a mixed agriculture. Uh, style. And again, we're looking at the dynamics of these crops uh, as well as inputs, other inputs in the system, and how individual households are using these, these resources in relation to all the other forms of capital available to them. Now, unfortunately for people in northern Ghana, uh, there have been several uh, uh, disastrous environmental shocks over the course of our study period. 2007 was the greatest flood in recorded history in northern Ghana. Okay. And, uh, and then uh, the years before that and the years that have followed that have been uh, nearly unprecedented drought cycles. So it, it's, uh, of course, been a painful situation for these, these communities, but it's also allowed us to look at resilience in this system. And I won't, um, I, won't, uh, I won't really have time to go into much of our results, but I'll just say that we've looked, we followed um, household income, we've followed metrics of uh, food security and daily caloric intake for households. We've looked at reliance on food aid before, um, during, and after these shocks, and we've also looked at infant mortality rates. And we're seeing a very strong signature again and again, and I won't present statistics at this point, but um, of, of the power of a diversified portfolio, if you will, for these uh, communities, all of whom live below the poverty level, but a, a strong, a much greater resilience for these communities, and an ability to, to actually use less food aid 
um, and experience higher caloric intake levels and various other metrics during and after, immediately after the shot. And that's all that I'll say. I'll just say um, that we're just still working on this, but we do have a paper based on the same data that does look at some of the livelihoods trade-offs that's coming out next month at a special issue of uh, Proceedings National Academy of Sciences on um, biodiversity and poverty traps. Thanks. And our next talk is Nathan Sayre, who's uh, Associate Professor of Geography, speaking on multifunctionality uh, on rangelands. Hi, I'm uh, going to summarize a bunch of different research uh, going back over the last 10 or 15 years, focusing on ranching in the southwestern U.S. Um, and reaching in some cases into New Mexico, specifically in the food deal of New Mexico and far southeastern Arizona, uh, where they bump up against Sonora and Chihuahua. This is an area on the U.S. side characterized by a, a mix of public and private land. Uh, both federal and state, a number of different agencies, uh, very complex jurisdictional issues and regulatory issues. It's an area of extraordinarily high biodiversity, uh, by some estimates the highest in North America, um, and also going along with that, of very high levels of spatial and temporal diversity, uh, variability, uh, and the, the challenges of dealing with that variability, both from a management perspective and a scientific perspective, are significant. Um, there, it's an area where climate change impacts have been uh, more pronounced than perhaps anywhere else uh, outside of the Arctic. And it has a long-standing uh, history of agro-pastoral land use, uh, mostly ranching, mostly cattle ranching, at least since about the 1930s. The uh, long-term ecological issue uh, for most vegetation scientists and ecologists in the area has been dominated by issues of uh, desertification or degradation, of loss of grasslands and their replacement by shrublands. Uh, still many debates about the various contributing factors to that. To what extent is it climate, to what extent is it um, livestock and mismanagement, that sort of thing. The multifunctionality of these landscapes uh, is not so much about different crops or different agricultural practices coexisting in one place. It's much more about the variety of um, uses and values and constituencies associated with those values on these lands. These are not lands that have been plowed, generally speaking. These are uh, rangelands that uh, produce their whatever they grow every year, um, a mixture of mostly native and in some cases non-native uh, vegetation. So the agricultural position or situation is, is all about feed cattle. On the other hand, there are very lively debates about and significant issues regarding wildlife. Um, there are very large numbers of listed, endangered, and threatened species and the regulatory issues that go along with that. Uh, extremely high diversity of herps and birds and a number of other things. There are issues of watershed quality and water supplies, water quantity and quality, and understanding the ways in which um, management of these very large extensive areas uh, can be altered to benefit um, water supplies for rapidly growing cities. There are a lot of issues around restoration, values associated with trying to bring back riparian areas, uh, various kinds of habitats for wildlife. The threats are numerous. Climate change is obviously one of the big ones. Desertification, loss of grasslands. Urbanization uh, has been a huge threat over the last 30 or 40 years, although somewhat tempered by the recent collapse of the real estate markets. Fragmentation. And then militarization is also an issue. The, the role of increasing border security and um, the presence of all kinds of essentially quasi-military institutions down there, uh, creating a lot of stress on the system. So the research that I'm involved with is aimed at the interface of ecological, historical, economic, and political issues, um, trying to bring scientists and landowners, particularly ranchers, together to address not just issues of ranch management and livestock production, but this whole suite of issues um, that are backed up or, or operate against the backdrop of a larger constituency, largely um, urban these days, especially in places like Arizona, um, and m manifesting their interest in a variety of ways, whether it's lawsuits to try to force various kinds of um, changes on public lands, um, various kinds of economic pressures associated with land values, that kind of thing. So the scientists and the ranchers, I'm working mostly with the Hornada Experimental Range, and ranchers in the Boot Hill area, the Mount High Borderlands Group, 
working together on um, generating new models of vegetation, soil, climate, livestock dynamics. Um, they go under the, the name of state and transition models, getting away from an older successional and more linear approach to these things. Um, specifically gathering local knowledge from ranchers who've been there for a long time and who have managed large pieces of land, but um, the same pieces of land for sometimes four and five generations, and asking them for their insights about exactly when did which changes happen on these pieces of land that you have been associated with for such a long time, and essentially trying to historicize the state and transition models rather than um, sort of constructing them in, a, in an atemporal framework. Um, this is then linked to um, uh, modern GIS and remote sensing technologies and databases, um, ultimately hoping to create a framework that it will provide real-time, remotely sensed, landscape-scale image um, data for monitoring and management. Um, the goal here is to identify restoration and management opportunities in time and space. In other words, what are the places where, on these huge landscapes, and it's impossible to, to the amount of money available to do things like restoration is limited, and the challenge of identifying not only where you can best affect restoration, but when. What are the circumstances with respect to, say, drought and rainfall and fire that will allow you to uh, achieve success on landscapes that have uh, resisted these efforts for a very long time? Um, and then finally, there's a comparative dimension of this research in which the Ornata Experimental Range Long-Term Experimental Research Site, um, we are also working with scientists from about 10 other LTERs around the country trying to develop a kind of standardized approach to understanding the social drivers of ecological change over long time scales. Am I out of time? Again, I mean, the examples that we're making are well known in Latin America. 
in Toledo, which is a famous anthropologist in Mexico, he found out in many communities that 60% of the livelihood depends on gathering in the country. And the rest comes from agricultural production. So I wouldn't be surprised that the, 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 the comments that we're talking about uh, are much more resilient than the ones that depend on hunting and depend on food gathering. Uh, yeah, there is a concept in Latin America called the gelite, which are the weeds that we eliminate with herbicides here. Farmers, on average, in Mexico, traditional farmers, harvest 2.5 tons of gelite per hectare. In order to, to, which are these gelite, weeds uh, that we call here. 2.5 tons. That's amazing. And, 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 and the research in, in Southeast Asia is showing they have 400 more times concentration than better. Um, but not always. It's not. There's not a you know, circular. There's some communities. Um, so, yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, I'm not really sure exactly. You know, I think it's going to take some time to see how this plays out. This is a new, new phenomenon. One more. Okay. Um, so I think we have time for one more question for this panel. If there's another question. Um, well, yeah, I wanted to address the. What about labor? Uh, well, I guess if I had, how much time do we have? I think we have like a minute or something. Yeah. A minute. <laughs> I think okay. Rather than touching on that, then I think I'll, I'll address this issue of, of incommensurability. Um, it's I find it uh, discouraging to think that bridges of these types can't be built, and I understand what you're saying about each system coming from certain ideological stance that in certain ways are antagonistic or mutually exclusive. Um, to me, the challenge is finding the places where they're not if they exist. Um, I think there's probably plenty of examples. Maybe the Zapotec science was a bad one. I thought the whole point he was making was that they weren't reliant on the fertilizer, that they were using it as an amendment or as something to, uh, to, to enhance their production but not, not be uh, a staple of it. Um, but I, I can't get past the idea that we have to try to find some middle ideology in the same way that, you know, it's, it, there are gradations between capitalism and communism. And there's plenty of solutions in the middle that, that try to take some of the benefits of both, like sharing and competitive markets, and try to find a way to, to put them together. So, um, to me, that, that's what I want to focus on, is where are these linkages? Where do the, and this is why I asked the question about hard scientists and social scientists, uh, and, and the work that, say, Jenny Reardon is doing down at US, UCSC. Where do we come together? Where do we share ideas? Where do we share ideologies? Where do we mix this stuff and, and quote unquote hybridize it to use the word I'm hearing way too much lately? Um, <laughs> that to me is where the solutions lie, not in having everybody as people ensconced in either political ideology would believe. If everybody believes this, then everything will work fine. Um, that may be. If we all had the same ideology, then it might. But in this messy reality, uh, I like to be optimistic and think that there are mutually beneficial solutions that can be arrived at that, that still uh, let go of the worst ravages of, of the conventional approach. You know, the people who are talking about farmers, the largest peasant movement in the world, the Campesina, says that they are at war with the corporate food regime because it's attempting there against the livelihoods. How are you going to reach that? Well, I'm talking about the U.S. context. Here's the Campesina here. There's 149 farmers that go out of business every day in this country. What are you going to tell them? Are we going to reach the corporate food regime that is pushing them out? No, I'm not talking about the corporate food regime. I was actually just talking about the techniques. I, I don't believe that the capitalist system and conventional ag are necessarily completely inextricable. I don't believe that all the techniques that are utilized by a particular ideological system are necessarily rooted entirely in ideology. I think that you can pull techniques and knowledge and <coughs> practical practice out of an ideological system and then and then try to work it into another. And so it's not about, to me it's not about, it's, they're not inextricable, at least that's my hope. Um, I would like to think that, that agroecological practices could be used in tandem with city planning practices that have absolutely nothing to do with agroecology, but there are ways that they can be meshed. And, and to me that, that's the, the struggle, is trying to find where these combinations of what might seem like incommensurable ideological or scientific systems can be combined. Maybe it's not possible. Maybe they are intrinsically at war, but it seems so. But Jesse, just from absolutely. a really practical point of view, I would very much support what you're saying. I've worked at Miguel has worked extensively with farmers in Latin America. I've worked also with farmers in Asia and Africa. 
and in general, they're very interested in seeing what modern science might have to offer them, if it's affordable, if it's accessible, if it's, they're not interested in isolation and working only with their traditional knowledge. They're really interested in access to modern science to the degree that it serves them. So just from a practical point of view, not to mention ideological, I would support what you're saying. So I, I hate to cut off this debate because this is exactly what we are in, in a way trying to foster and bring out here and I think it's, it's great. We've had a great conversation. Um, but I also want to give the other people that, um, that we have on the program their time. And I also want to say that I hope these conversations are going to continue. That's um, what we're really trying to foster. So thank you all to the panelists. And um, our next panel is uh, moving into assessment for diversified farming systems and health implications. Um, and the first talk is by Marsha DeLong. Actually, um, yeah. Wendy's going to start, and I'm going to go last on our group, and okay. it's Marcia. All right. So Wendy uh, Silvers, professor at ESPM, is going to speak about the Marin Carbon Project, Climate Change in the Meat. So, so we switched around a little bit so that I can introduce the project. I'm Wendy Silver, and I'm a biochemist and an ecosystem ecologist. And Jesse, I don't really consider myself a physical scientist, but I think that's what I think we fall into that category of not social scientists. Um, the my what I'm going to talk about, and then the next two talks introduce the Marine Carbon Project, which is a consortium of researchers and extension and agricultural producers and organizations, county and federal agencies, uh, the Resource Conservation District, private range consultants and landowners and land managers. And I have to write it down because I can't ever be sure that I'm going to absolutely include everybody in our group. Um, but it's important because it's a very integrated, collaborative group of people. And we're really proud of our organization. Um, we came together to try to understand the potential for soil carbon sequestration in rangeland systems and to contribute, contribute to greenhouse gas emissions reduction um, in these ecosystems. Um, I'm the lead scientist of this group. Uh, there are several other scientists working on it. You'll hear about some of the science from the others. Uh, the project began in 2008, and we started off by just reviewing the literature about carbon pools in rangeland systems in California uh, with regard to management. And then we conducted an intensive survey in Marin and Sonoma counties. And the results of those studies found that uh, soil carbon pools vary by a factor of two or three um, in the state and also within that region. And that suggested to us that you could manipulate carbon pools through management. Uh, and that potentially could have an impact on the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, this is because rangelands cover uh, about 30% of the country and about 50% of the state. And, uh, about 30% of the land use globally. So these are widespread ecosystems, and if we can figure out ways to manage them so that they sequester a little bit of carbon, uh, a little bit can go a long way over a large land area. So Marcia and Becca, Becca and Marcia in that order, are gonna talk about some of the actual research activities that are underway right now. I just wanna mention uh, that we have some uh, new projects starting. Uh, one is a uh, collaboration with Environmental Defense Fund at Colorado State University on protocol development for rangeland ecosystems. That's really looking at uh, how much, what do we need to know about uh, carbon dynamics and multiple use uh, activities on these lands to develop a protocol for carbon uh, at the state or the national level. Um, and as part of this, we're, we're collecting a lot of data that I think the ranchers are very interested in, which is data on productivity, data on different management in the region, uh, data, data on plant community composition, and how all of these factors are related. Um, another project that was recently funded is looking at carbon sequestration potential and greenhouse gas emissions reduction from feedlot systems, and uh, comparing those management practices and that potential with grass-fed systems. Um, and then finally, uh, we received, uh, my group and a group from Colorado State University received an AFRI planning grant from USDA, again, to look at uh, the potential for management of carbon in rangeland systems, uh, this time throughout the western U.S. Uh, we will be putting together an AFRI grant. These are large integrated grants um, that uh, really encourage the collaboration between social and natural scientists. So we would love to hear from people who are interested in this effort. 
um, again focusing on uh, really adaptation and mitigation of climate change using rangelands in the western U.S. So with that, I will leave it to my group to play in
There are a number of co-benefits um, that can help to mitigate or add that to climate change, such as increasing soil moisture and buffering against uh, drought or extreme conditions. We also have a small drought experiment going on. Um, and there are a lot of other co-benefits, such as diverting organic waste from the landfills or uh, uh, having a technique for sustainable manure management. And Marcia will touch on that a little bit. Um, this data will inform a comprehensive life cycle assessment, uh, which is our next phase of the project, and it's the component that Marcy is going to talk more about. Um, and again, as I said, we're trying to integrate this, the science-based uh, aspect of carbon cycling with uh, our experts in the Marine Carbon Project to work on different facets of rangeland management. Thank you. Thank you. Life cycle assessment on the costs and benefits of using compost as an organic amendment on rangelands. results we found regarding some of the benefits of using compost on various grasslands here in California. Um, and this led us to the, the larger question of, does composting for application to these various grasslands, looking at the full, the full system of the composting process, lead to a net reduction in greenhouse gas emissions overall? And this is the topic of my postdoc here in the Silver Lab and is building on a lot of the previous work that you just heard about. So before diving into some of the details of the composting greenhouse gas budgeting, I just wanted to bring you back to the big picture of the fact that our environmental challenges today are multifaceted. We're dealing not only with um, climate change that's driven by the greenhouse gases that are the topic of this specific research, but we also have a huge waste management crisis in terms of both um, plant and food waste that are going into landfills and manure management. And we also have uh, a very rapidly growing population with another billion people expected in just over one decade. So one of the points that I want you to leave today with is that compost may be a multifaceted solution to some of these problems, but we need to be very careful because the solution is quite case specific. So in order to start quantifying the greenhouse gas emissions from the composting process, we have to realize that there's many stages of this process. Um, and now we're seeing some of the changes from Keynote here. Um, but uh, these phases range from actually sourcing the materials and transporting them to a composting facility, then the actual process of composting, uh, of composting itself, then transporting the compost to a field site and applying it onto the fields, and then finally bottling the results of that compost uh, through the land over, over the long term. So each of these phases of the composting process are associated with greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and those emissions <coughs> include both the, um, the transport of machinery and energy costs, and also the emissions from the decomposition and microbial populations of the composting pile, and uh, also the direct and indirect influences of greenhouse gases on the land um, with regards to both plant growth and the effects that this has on the nutrition of grazers. So once we've identified all the components of the composting process, can we simply add up the, the greenhouse gases from each of these phases in a global warming um, potential form and subtract our expected carbon sequestration potential and then consider the cost of composting? And I would say no. And that's because alternate scenarios are not actually zero emission in a case where you're diverting where your source materials are being diverted from different waste streams. So if we quickly consider um, another scenario where you, a simple case where you have no amendment, um, you'll note that you still have these source materials producing greenhouse gas emissions probably in much larger amounts in, in the landfills and manure management systems. And additionally, you're much less likely to capture, uh, to sequester carbon in those soils. And if you want to consider a case where you'll still get the benefits potentially of carbon sequestration, such as adding uh, an alternate amendment, such as 
fertilizer, again, you still have these emissions coming from waste, wa different waste streams, and then you also have um, the production of the, the fertilizer itself. So hopefully you can kind of get a glimpse of what a complicated situation this is. So as part of the Marine Carbon Project, we are tackling this question of both modeling and field work. Um, and there's a few exciting features of the field work, and one is the fact that since not all compost is created equal, so it's very, it's a very nice idea that we can take this compost, measure the emissions from the compost during the composting process and follow that through our field sites in direct comparison with other applications, such as manure, which we're doing, and, and in the treatment scenario. Um, we are also using corn as a part of our feedstock. And um, by using a C4 plant on C3 soils, we'll be able to trace the carbon from our compost um, as over time, which is another exciting feature of this experiment. Um, this experiment is, is beginning right now as we speak. A lot of preliminary work is well underway and we'll be picking off this field season in the summer. And I just wanted to end by reiterating that compost under certain circumstances, according to the research that we've been developing in this lab, could potentially be a winning scenario in, a, in um, several cases. And also, I want to urge all of you to uh, consider applying life cycle assessment type concepts, such as the one described here, to think creatively and thoroughly about how we can best use our constrained resources. Specifically, my study measures the impact of intercropping with three different uh, flowering plant species, and they're listed here. And uh, to measure the impact of planting these uh, flowering plant species in, in vineyards and their impact on two key wine grape pests. One is the western grape leafhopper, and one is referred to as the flying mini bug. So these uh, plant species here, Facelia, Amimagus, and Dalcus carota, uh, the reason that these three have been selected is because in prior research that have been shown to extend the longevity or fecundity of other important uh, parasitoids. Uh, they also fit within the, the agronomic practices of the vineyards themselves, and they provide floral resources throughout the entire growing season. Ami in the early spring, I mean, uh, Facilia in the early spring, Ami magus in the top right, uh, mid 
summer and Ducks Carota uh, toward the end of the growing season. Okay. So my study uh, quantifies the field level impacts on population densities of these uh, both pests and beneficial insects and then explores what might be the biological mechanisms that are enhanced through the addition of more resources. So this is one of our research sites in the early spring and what I'll do in my uh, last remaining minutes is explain some of the details of the study design. So uh, the field work utilizes a, uh, a randomized block design with four replicates. So this is one of our treatment plots. Uh, we have, of course, a control plot with no treatment at all. So uh, with the field sites, we use four replicates, and then we do a series of laboratory studies evaluating the impact of floral resources on the physiology of individual insects. And for those, we use uh, 20 replicates. So the lab experiments, to go through some of the details of the study, the lab experiments uh, do attempt to do a number of things. First, to actually substantiate that nectar feeding is occurring. That is, do these parasitoids, these biological control agents, actually feed on these nectars? So that we've been able to, to measure, and there's a significant difference by measuring the sugar gut content of these parasitoids. We find a significant difference between our treatments of those exposed to floral resources in our control. One minute. Okay. So in addition to that, uh, we're measuring what is the impact on uh, longevity. How long do these organisms live when exposed to floral resources? What is their overall fecundity? And then out at the field level, we're measuring what are the overall population density between our control plots and our treatment plots in terms of uh, presence of pests and beneficial insects. So I'll stop there since Great. <laughs> <laughs> and our next talk is by Mr. Wilson, um, PhD candidate in ESCOM as well, on farm habitat to enhance biological control. Does landscape context matter? All right, thanks. My name is Houston Wilson. I'm a third year PhD student in ESPM, and what I'm going to talk about today is another component of a lot of research that's evaluating the influence of habitat diversity on a much larger spatial scale in vineyards uh, with these same vineyard pests that I'll just mention in this presentation. And we want to look at the influence of habitat diversity around these farms in order to understand how it could potentially influence the effectiveness of these field scale habitat diversification uh, programs. So, this research stems out of a growing body of literature that's been demonstrating that local populations of natural enemies and subsequently biological control appears to be impacted by the area and composition of natural habitats surrounding the farm. Now, one of the main arguments put forward for why this might be occurring is that these natural habitats are serving as source pools for natural enemies of insect pests. So you can imagine in a very simplified agricultural landscape, these natural habitats being a very far distance from farm, they are uh, going to have a much longer delay in the colonization of the crop by the natural enemies, uh, as versus having a natural habitat much closer to the farm. That delay is going to result in a longer period for, for, for pests to evolve the populations of the crops and crop fields. Um, simultaneously, the quality of those habitats are really important. You could have some sort of semi-natural non-crop habitat close to your farm, but if it's not composed of right plant species that would support these overwintering natural enemies, um, it may not serve as well as a source of, uh, of natural enemies in the crop system. Now there's you know exceptions to this and other kind of arguments, but that's basically uh, a nutshell of my hypothesis and in my research. So what I'm going to outline now are the three main components of the work I'm conducting. Uh, it's a four-year study. I'm in my second year of it right now. And there's three primary components. Number one is a study that's looking at, um, and let me just step back for a second, these studies are all going to be in vineyards and now in Sonoma County, um, and the field scale diversification treatment that we'll be exploring is, the, uh, is similar to what I'll be presenting as a floral resource function. So the first component of the study is to evaluate multiple vineyards that are fairly evenly spread along a continuum of landscape heterogeneity here. Uh, we have 20 vineyard sites. And for the first two years of the study, we want to look at just how insect populations and subsequently biological control change 
with increasing habitat diversity around these farms. Subsequent to this, uh, there'll be another two years of comparing monoculture blocks to versified blocks in these different landscapes. Again, 20 sites, you have these paired blocks controlling the treatment in the different landscapes. The idea being that we think diversification in vineyards is going to enhance biological control much more substantially in these specific landscapes. Um, you would imagine in these very simplified landscapes down here where you to diversify uh, to enhance natural enemy control pests. The source habitats of those natural enemies are so far away that they're going to be very delayed in arriving in the farm and utilizing that diversification. So when you compare a uh, simplified and diversified plot in that simple landscape, you may not see much of an enhancement in biological control. Ultimately, at the very end of the spectrum here, with a lot of habitat around the farm, where you to diversify, there's already so many natural enemies moving into the farm. Um, while diversification may enhance their ability to control pests, it may not be as pronounced because the simplified plots are receiving so many, so many natural enemies from the farm. Now, to further substantiate that trend, we want to look at dispersal of natural enemies out of these patches of non-crop habitat. So another component of this study is looking at how uh, natural enemy and pest densities change as you move at greater distances away from uh, patches of natural habitat. Again, two years studying riparian habitat, and then another two years looking at the same trend woodland habitat. These two have been selected because they're the primary uh, habitat types found in that one's county. And then lastly, to um, substantiate the role that these natural habitats are having as, as, as serving as a wintering habitat for beneficial insects, we'll be looking in, again, riparian and woodland habitats at the different plant species that uh, these habitats are comprised of to see which key species may be serving as a wintering habitat for natural enemies of these insects. So, it's not just that you see some trend moving away from riparian or woodland habitat. You, uh, we want to try to substantiate that it's you know X, Y, and Z plants in those habitats that are really benefiting natural enemies. So in the end, um, the idea is to figure out what natural enemies are living and are overwintering in these habitats, how they move into the cropping system, and then how they enhance biological control when it's simplified versus diversified. We'll stop there. is um, Jerry Sposito, a professor in ESPOM, who's going to speak on assessing soils for diversified farming systems. Okay, so now for something completely different. <laughs> what I'm going to say to you actually is so basic and commonsensical that it uh, probably has not been thought much about. It actually underlies everything you've been hearing so far, but uh, surprisingly has not been given the kind of attention that it might have been. In fact, even though the ideas behind it are at least 30 to 50 years old, it's been implemented in a modern sense only in the last decade. And that's where most of the research has gone on. And that has to do with assessing soils for uh, any kind of farming system, but diversified farming systems in general. A number of years ago, uh, the famous Berkeley soil scientist, Hans Hieny, uh, made this remark to me, I think it was after a dinner, he said, you know, uh, Gary, organic farming only makes sense on good soils. Now, what Hans meant, which we would put into a modern parlance, is that uh, just touch it. Uh, is that um, diversified farming systems make sense only after a soil has been evaluated for its capability to provide the ecosystem services that that farming system needs. That's, that's another way to put what, uh, what I'm saying. And here's an example of it here. This is a map, worldwide map, showing the aerial extent of soils that have been uh, found to, or been assessed to have low nutrient capital, which simply means that they have very small reserves of easily weatherable minerals that provide the nutrients to, to plants that grow in the soil. <clears throat> and where it's red or orange is where there are large areas of this problem, and where it's green is there are areas where it's been assessed to be be different from that. The advance on this is where? Sorry? There's an arrow. Excuse me, the arrow is There you go. Now, the interesting thing about this, thank you. Now, the interesting thing about this, uh, oh well, never was good at mechanical things. 
uh, the interesting thing about all this is that there are only C three soil properties on which on which all this assessment is based, and they're straightforward properties related to the classification systems of soils and so forth. One of them is texture, and that technically refers to the percent of sand, silt, and clay-sized particles. You see examples up there on the left. There, the sand is large, the, the clay and the silt are smaller. It refers to the percentage of each one of those. That's called texture, and this determines the nature of the pore space. It determines the air holding capacity of the soil so that roots and microorganisms can respire. It also uh, affects water holding capacity and how quickly water can move through a soil. In general, soils which have a lot of clay have a lot of porosity, but the pores are really little. The soils with a lot of sand have low porosity, relatively speaking, but the pores are very large, and of course that makes a, a big difference. The other, another property is, um, is mineralogy, which refers to the types of minerals present, of course. And, uh, actually I wanted to go back to the other one. <laughs> Everybody's helping out. <laughs> so uh, this refers to the types of minerals which are present. These are the minerals, as I just mentioned, that serve as reservoirs for biogeochemical cycling of nutrients in soils. The rock-forming minerals that are large size, sand and silt size, are slowly weathering, uh, although relatively faster than the smaller ones, and, and they are providing the nutrients on a low level. The clay size fraction holds the nutrients on the surface of the particles and minerals make up. And so it's like food in the fridge, you can get it pretty quickly, but it doesn't uh, take a long time to supply. And finally, humus content, or usually organic carbon content, which of course refers to the amount of humus. I, there's a nice uh, picture of humus there uh, below the ground where the litter is in this uh, picture as you can see. Soil humus sustains the life cycles of microbes, and, so, and they are the mediators of all the biogeochemical cycling that go on for everybody. Well, nutrients and toxicants, and people who have worked on the problem of soil health, which can be defined in the same way that human health can be defined, have found that this is the most strongly correlated with the health of soil. This is really important, and you already heard this from back and from others. If I did a quick calculation, it looked like you were talking about a very small percentage increase in organic carbon content made a huge difference on how much carbon offset that the soil could, could sustain. So that's very, very important. Now where this all comes together is in very recent times through the use of software-based uh, geographic information systems, but also other soil data systems that combine uh, geospatial soil information with geomorphological information, with climate information, into what are called pedotransfer functions. Pedotransfer functions basically are, uh, in other parlance, it would be like multiple regression equations. And they're used to transform without a causal implication soil properties into usable soil functions that people need to know about. And these in turn can be placed into a soil inference system, which then gives advice about a particular set of land and the area of land. And this is all based in software. So it means that you start with a digital soil map, which is ultimately going to be interactive. So you touch on it and you find out what is called the fertility capability classification of the soil. And there are a whole host that this was developed some years ago, but it's only been in the last five or six years that it's really taken off. But this system will allow you to assess the soil with all of this information as to how well it is just in nature to provide the kind of support for the plants that you're interested in growing, and in particular for a diversified farming system. And unlike some other areas here, this is actually value free, it's ideology free. We need to know what the soil can do for us and this is an objective way to assess it. Uh, the very first slide that I showed gave a reference to a paper in. Annual Reviews of Environment and Resources in 2007 by Paul Medow, which covers all of this. And thank you very much.
I mean, is it is still a matter of sort of enhancing the life already existing there, or perhaps can it affect the, the plants or animal matters in that area? I'm just so curious. So I think like an invasive species would affect it in general. Can you answer that from the plant perspective? Because um, so in California, um, a lot of our grasslands are non-native annual grasses, um, and they have been that way since the late 18th century. Um, so there's a, a whole body of, of research and nonprofits and a lot of other organizations trying to reestablish perennial plants. Um, but one of the sites that we work at, uh, the, the landowners themselves are really interested in, in promoting and uh, maintaining their perennial plants. Um, so before we started uh, anything, we wanted to make sure that we had a measure in our research that would assess any changes to the plant community that we could see. Um, so all I can say is so far we haven't seen any changes in the plant community composition. We've just seen more growth, but we haven't seen a change. We haven't seen any new species, uh, any, uh, any kind of preference for promoting the growth of a noxious invasive. But um, this is just three years into the project, so it's something that we're going to keep monitoring. As far as the quality goes, I don't know if you wanted to say anything more about that, but um, yeah, well, fertilizers, fertilizers in general have been shown to have some impacts on, on um, community composition just in the literature, so you, would, you could expect that there would be some long-term influence if you're regularly adding a fertilizer when you did before, um, but because all compost and maybe this is where method was going are very different, they're, they're unique, it depends what you put in them, and it depends how they're managed, and then that's going to um, that's going to in, in many ways impact what it does to the land itself. So um, there's numerous there's a few labs out there. Um, one part in particular in Canada who's done a lot of research on, on compost and, and it's the quality of the compost. But there haven't been many studies that go out for a long period of time um, compare well even measure the compost impacts on the land but certainly not that compared different compost to each other or even compost to anymore. So I think a lot of that is because of the complexity of the issue and those are things that, you know, with our study, hopefully studying from the beginning to end of the process, we'll be able to get a better grasp on. Okay, I think we're at, out of time, unfortunately, so we'll have to move on to our last session, uh, which is um, the first by Farming System Health and Functional Ag in the Global South. Um, I looked at several different types of 
what are called fertilizer tree systems. Um, this, is, this is one of the tree systems I work with, Glaricidia intercropping. How it works is the trees are pruned several times a year and the nitrogen rich foliage is buried in the soil where it decomposes and provides uh, nitrogen and enriches soil organic matter. So how do these systems fare in a drought of your demonic culture? Well, um, several possibilities come to mind. Um, the negative possibility would be they compete for soil water with the maize. And in that case, you might expect these to do very poorly in drought conditions. But um, other possibilities would include a facilitation effect where maybe the, the trees improve the microclimate um, and reduce soil temperatures, for example. And um, they could also improve soil texture, soil organic matter, um, and water holding capacity. So I wanted to see what actually happened. In order to test this, I needed to figure out how to create a drought. And with a very small budget, working in a remote location in a developing country, this was a big challenge. I couldn't apply existing models of rainout shelters. So um, my low budget approach was to create these basically, um, they're kind of similar to the tobacco drying sheds that are used in Malawi with uh, vertical poles and plastic roofs. Um, and they actually did quite well at excluding rainfall within a certain buffer zone and um, I used them to create uh, drought for roughly the last half of the growing season um, over the course of two years. I'm just gonna focus on the data from the second year, which, um, which turned out much better than the first year. So this is the, this is the upshot of, of what I saw um, in these agroforestry systems under drought. Um, you can see that um, you can see that the under ambient conditions marked here in green, the yield of the Glaricidia plots, the agroforestry plots, was much, much higher than monoculture baits. Um, as an aside, there were also inorganic nitrogen additions to this experiment in a full factorial design, and, and this, I don't have time to get into this, so this is just averaging across all nitrogen levels. Um, so under, uh, under drought conditions, obviously both both yields are going to drop remarkably. And so which of our initial hypotheses was correct? Well, it looks as though, um, at worst, we can say that, that this agroforestry system doesn't do any harm in a drought. Um, certainly, the, the plots with Glaricidia produced as much or probably a little more maize than the monoculture plots under drought. Um, the, the size of the drop is actually larger proportionally in the Glaricidia, and I'm still trying to figure out why that is. So that shows the difference in the proportional drop. I only have a moment left, so I'm just going to mention also that this is not the full story. This dealt with an established agroforestry system with mature trees that have been improving the soil for a long period of time. It's also important to look at what happens with seedlings in a drought. Seedlings can have difficulty establishing in a drought, and so our optimism about mature trees would be can't be extended to seedlings. Well, fortunately, this particular species does very well under drought conditions. I had actually a 100% survival rate for my 400-odd seedlings over the course of the year. And um, it turns out that when you plant the seedlings, is actually more important than whether you hit them with a, a, an eight-week drought. So this research is still continuing, but I think it is really quite important to do empirical work like this on climate change issues in the developing world. Thanks. Thank She's the academic coordinator of the Center for Sustainable Resource Development, and she's going to be speaking about diversity as core value in building global agro-environmental leadership. And I have to say that um, I was going to talk about uh, sustainable pineapple in Costa Rica, but that uh, project has been delayed, and so I don't have enough to say about it. So then. I'm, I'm, I'm begging your patience in talking about something that's not research oriented, but it is uh, diversity oriented, and it's the environmental leadership program that I co-direct with David Silverman here in Berkeley, and it's it's good for you guys to know about it because you may you may want to be involved um, as participants, as uh, workers. Andy knows it very well as um, observers and so forth. But the main focus of this couple of minutes is to say that I really do feel like the diverse aspects of this program in terms of the discipline, the participants, the geographies, the cultures, um, the perspectives that people are exposed to is the strength of the program 
And uh, rather than have it disappear um, due to budget cuts and so forth, it sustains itself going on our 11th year. That in itself is a success. Um, so it's a, it's a capacity building program here on campus. Many of the diversified farming systems faculty that you know are involved of diverse um, viewpoints. Um, Claire Kremen, Miguel Altieri, David Zimmerman, Isha Ray, Justin Bershares. We hope Nancy Peluso will get more involved. And um, <laughs> I'm just like Gary here. What is the deal with the next slide? Is it, um, down, 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 oh, down, down, yes. okay, so to verify the diversity, strength and diversity, this is international, people come from all over the world to Berkeley for a few weeks, um, heavy Asian component reflecting the population of the world, also Africa, all over Africa, all over um, North America, Central and South America, Russia, the former Soviet republics, they are here in Berkeley sharing their expertise, experience, peer learning, and with the faculty. Again, strength and diversity. We put the question, what could we change to improve this program? What could we, how could we make it more meaningful for you, year to year to year? What could we change? And the one component they did not want to change was the diverse composition of the group. That's what they learn most from. So that's another, okay, so you saw that. And then also it's interdisciplinary. It's not only that we bring together an interdisciplinary team here at Berkeley to interact with them, faculty and non-faculty non, non experts, but they themselves are coming in from the social, physical, environmental, legal, economic sciences to learn from each other, law, business, so it's diversity all the way. And gender, I mean, <clears throat> of course we know most of the farmers in Africa, for instance, are women farmers and around the world. We don't just talk about agricultural issues or forestry issues, but it's been important to try to have gender equity. We work hard on that. And it's difficult sometimes, for, particularly from Africa. But I, Nancy, this year we have a lot of African women scientists and, and also Indonesian women who make Get you. Your there. schedule is One quite full, I must say. I'm not on space. <laughs> um, okay, so with respect to diversity of opinion, that's why I was having a little go at it with Miguel earlier today. He works with us, um, and so does David. And we have various perspectives on biotechnology, various perspectives on agroecology. We have field trips to KK Valley to look at diversified farming systems, organic farmers, KK Organics, talk with the Community Alliance for Family Farmers, and so on and so forth. But we also go to Salinas Valley, the highest uh, product, product, productivity valley of the, wor of the world, I believe, with respect to horticulture per unit, mainly monocrop, small monocrop intensive agriculture. It's very interesting for farmers from around the world to see that and to contrast them. Um, those are the, our main workshops. And um, so leadership is a big part of this. It's the process skills. It's not just the science and policy skills. It's communication, public speaking, advocacy, facilitation, negotiation, how you become a change agent, how you take knowledge and carry it forward in very um, dangerous and often regressive environments is by being exposed to all kinds of leadership. Now, Miguel could have been up here too, but we have Norman Borlaug up there. Do you recognize him? Father of the Green Revolution. He won the Nobel Prize for Fighting Hunger in 1974, I believe. Very controversial. Um, but the participants were extremely excited to be exposed to Norman Borlaug and to meet and speak with him. At the same time, they're meeting with Mayor Bates and Alice Waters and J Judith Redman, farmer in KP Valley, with um, leaders from around the world, with different perspectives. And um, with respect to sustainability and, and um, policy, science and policy, there's a combination of practicum up in um, botanical, bar uh, the botanical gardens doing water quality monitoring with Vince Resch. 
different faculty that you may recognize, Isha, Isha Ray, Mathis Wagadarho, who's the founder of the Ecological Footprint, always comes in and we do lots of exercises, um, what he calls a sustainability workout, which um, gets people sweating about the sacrifices every, every one of us needs to make for a sustainable planet. And finally, oh wait, 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 I wanted to show that one again. Oh gosh, I can't. Up here, in that last one, I can't go back, Alistair. Can we maybe do it during Q&A and just wrap up here? Okay, I will do it. Um, but I wanted to point out, because we were there just last week, um, one of the people in the photos from the Botanical Garden, I'm running out of time. Right. It's my, I'm running out of time. Okay. One of the photos in the last um, slide, I believe, he was in the Botanical Garden, is Priti Arasandi from Indonesia, from East Java, who just won the Golden Environmental Prize um, for his incredible work on water quality monitoring using a habitat assessment analysis, which Vince Resch mentored him with. It was really exciting for him to come. So this is an opportunity for um, Berkeley to shine with people who can take that knowledge and really improve the lives of, I would say, millions. There are more than a million people who have been drinking polluted water from the river that Equal Time helped to clean up with Priti Arasandi's leadership, and that's why he was recognized by Goldman Awards. And Vince played a big role, and so did everybody else who were able to learn from him in Berkeley. So, diversity is the strength of this program. He's going to speak about oil palm prospects and rationale for smallholder and diversified farming. So yeah, I'm going to talk about my uh, my study system first, and then tell you about uh, exactly what are the options to diversify, and what are the benefits and negatives to doing that, and what are the qualities. Huh. Those usually there are supposed to be graphs here. <laughs> I'll tell you what they what they said. Um, so then I'll tell you about, um, really quick, about what are the qualities of oil palm that make diversified farming either more ki uh, capable or what are the things about oil palm that make diversified farming more, bit more difficult, what are the benefits and negatives that people can derive from diversified farming. Um, and then finally I'll talk about some of my ideas and um, what, what I'm working on. So uh, what these graphs show is that oil palm is, uh, within the tropics, it's one of the fastest growing large crops. Um, and it also has one of the largest potentials to expand further. Um, I, w I wish I had the graphs because they're, they're uh, really impactful, but um, it's okay. So what that means is that it's a priority if we're thinking about future land use change. Uh, oil palm is going to be expanding rapidly. It's already the largest perennial crop on Earth. Um, so I mean, if you think about how much energy has been devoted, to diversifying carb uh, coffee, like shade coffee, uh, oil palms are already much larger than that. It's growing um, literally exponentially, and it's uh, expanding across the tropics too, even though right now it's mostly concentrated in Southeast Asia. All right, cool. So um, oil palm grows for 25 years, and then there's a five-year period where it's cut down and replanted. So that alone has a lot of diversity inherent within a single crop. And one of the things that I'm personally interested in is diversifying a system based on the inherent qualities of that crop versus other methods like intercropping with different crops. This one crop can be grown a lot of different ways based on when you plant it, over the space that you plant it, when you cut it down, and how you do that. But there's also a lot of ways to, um, to diversify the farming, uh, the different ways of getting revenue from the same piece of land with oil palm. So here we have, um, you can see some pictures where they're integrating livestock and oil palm. And that's actually, there's been um, a huge push recently to do that uh, on, a, on a massive scale. And so that's going to be very common in the future. Uh, integra integrative pest management is uh, really uh, ubiquitous in the oil palm. And uh, there's even some cases where oil palm is being intercropped 
with other species. But one major difference about oil palm that limits the potential to be intercropped with other species is that it is like demanding. So while coffee can, benefit, can uh, do well underneath the canopy, and you can have an overstory uh, to diversify, oil palm is kind of the, the opposite. Oil palm is what you're going to want to make your, your overstory, and you're going to want to intercrop with species that are uh, shade taller and underneath it. Um, ah, more of my fingers are going. Okay, uh, <laughs> so one of the things that I'm personally working on uh, is the is changing the spatial and temporal way that oil palm is grown in order to create heterogeneity across the landscape, which can benefit both the environment and also uh, uh, the economics of the local area. So if you can imagine having you plant, which, which is currently what's going on, like kilometers and kilometers on end of oil palm all at once, that means your labor demand, so oil palm has a really high labor demand to harvest it continually, uh, once it starts fruiting, but that doesn't start for five years. So then all of a sudden after five years, you have a huge labor demand spike that continues for the next um, 20 years, and then everything's cut down, and there's, everyone's out of work for a while. And then what happens, um, what, I'm, what I'm researching also along these lines, what happens when that goes on, is everyone, the local people, have to immediately find another source of income. They're hunting off, oftentimes unsustainably in the forest during that five year period. Um, they're suffering. Uh, pretty dramatic decrease in livelihood very quickly. So by diversifying the, the spatial context of when you plant and scale the grain the landscape, you're going to have different plantations becoming, um, or even a single plantation that you break up, becoming um, fruiting at different times. So you have a constant supply of, uh, uh, of income, of labor. Uh, the, the overall landscape is uh, not being a giant uh, clear cut area, and it's a potentially could be good for both the people and the environment. Thank you, Mike. Okay, our last speaker today and in the session is Nancy Peluso, professor in ESCO. She's going to speak about smallholder forest and migrant labor livelihoods in Java, Indonesia. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, and thanks especially to uh, Alice there who uh, put this on at the very last minute. Okay. Um, I uh, am just going to be talking a little bit uh, generally about uh, some of the work that I'm, I'm, I'm doing that's related to diversified farming and uh, livelihoods. I work on uh, agrarian and forest politics. Uh, if you're working on agriculture and forests anywhere in the world as part of the same agrarian landscape, which is basically uh, how I think of them, you have to be working on politics and you have to be working on farmers. And you're probably working in systems where there's various degrees of diversified uh, farming going on. Okay, so um, uh, I do most of my work uh, in Indonesia, as some of you know. I worked in different parts of Indonesia, and in fact, parts of Indonesia that have extremely different and well known for being different uh, agroecosystems or agroforestry systems. Okay? So um, I'm just going to talk about two of those today. Uh, let's see. Okay. Um, I, I also, uh, I don't think I'm known as being a feminist political ecologist, uh, but I am totally a feminist, and I am totally a political ecologist. And what I'm trying to do in a book that I'm working on uh, right now is try to put uh, these things very much in conversation with each other so that it's not just all feminist studies, not just all about gender, okay? So what that means for me in terms of landscape studies, I'm working on a book in West Kalimantan uh, on the three crops, I'll show you some pictures in a second, uh, that uh, preceded uh, Matt's crops as the most important uh, trees in these landscapes. And um, what I want to do is I want to write about them situating each of the social histories of the crops and their kind of socio-natural histories in the landscape with each other, how they have articulated and how uh, meaning how they've worked together, how they've come together in, in different kinds of moments of history, and looking, in fact, at the histories of social natural relations both within a single tree crop and um, uh, across them. So, in general, I'm interested in the effects on household livelihoods of a variety of things. Uh, forest fragmentation, for example, versus 
the formation of extensive political forests, okay? The, whether these are production, protection, uh, forests, or nature reserves. Uh, the increasing commodification around the world of resources, land, and ecosystem services. Uh, competing uh, what we call territorializations, territorial strategies for managing uh, the land, which are competing with each other. Ancestral land conservation, uh, industrial agriculture, urban development, uh, and so on. And uh, again, keeping these things, trying to figure out ways to be clear about what's going on, but to look at them in situated uh, relationships to one another. Okay, so um, uh, I work in the Teak Forest in central Java and ask these questions. These are forests um, uh, that have been uh, very much fragmented, actually, uh, over the years, but have been, are probably the longest uh, existing forest plantations in Indonesia and much of Southeast Asia established in the early uh, 19th century under the Dutch. Uh, some people, of foresters, would even argue that in fact they were established as plantations of sorts in, um, uh, in the period when the Buddhists and Hindus were coming over from India, at which time they were thought to have brought the teak uh, from that part of the world into China. And I work in um, uh, the teak forest village. This is a teak forest village that I've been working in. Uh, you can see that it's surrounded by teak. This is a recent picture, um, and uh, uh, these trees actually here are extremely young. They're only six years old. Um, and, and young in the sense that teak needs to grow to 60 to 80 years uh, of age before it's really viable for uh, an extremely valuable forest product. Um, and I started a restudy. Uh, I, work, I worked there in 1985 and studied um, uh, uh, forest livelihoods and the relationships between foresters and villagers and kind of history of, of uh, forestry in Indonesia. Uh, moving away from logging and uh, food production uh, in agroforestry kinds of things on the state forestry lands uh, to new spatial relations of resource mining, actually taking oil out of the teak forest areas um, and uh, privatizing teak forest growth on uh, private lands, still uh, doing rice and basically doing uh, what I would call a situated socio-natural uh, history of Indonesia. In West Kalimantan, I'm looking at Maranti, durian, and rubber, the three most important trees uh, in uh, the Kalimantan landscape until about 10 years ago. Um, and uh, what I'm trying to do is separate uh, social and landscape histories of each of them um, and trying to situate uh, the emergence and transformations in smallholder rubber production and fruit agroforestry in West Kalimantan as the political forest came into being. Okay? Uh, these are also, in some places, very racialized landscape um, and uh, have very different kinds of um, uh, processes going on uh, in, in the Javanese tea plantations. So just in conclusion, um, I, one of the most important things I think that's, that's happened uh, as I go back and think about a forest that I worked in 25 years ago uh, on household livelihoods is that people who did not travel very much for work, they were very forest dependent, um, or did labor around uh, in agriculture and in, in forest product uh, development in, in their vicinity. This is in Java in these two forest areas. Now they are the ones that are being hired to come and work in the oil palm plantations as contract labor, as um, uh, as forest clearers and so on. So these kind of global transformations can be actually understood through uh, the histories of um, forest livelihood and labor uh, in, from the perspective of either Java or from the West Kalimantan side. Thanks. Thank you. Let's take seven. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Alistair would like to. Is he, are you ready? This is to Amber. Are the other examples of interspersed trees or plants in use in agriculture in Africa? Yes. Yes. There are many. <laughs> um, one interesting and somewhat more ecological example is the practice in West Africa of um, 
using acacia albida trees as um, interspersed throughout millet and sorghum farmlands. Um, these very large mature trees actually lose their leaves at exactly the time of the year when the grain crops are growing their leaves. It's called reverse phenology. And so they don't interfere with the light interception of the grain crop, um, but they do contribute a lot of nitrogen and improve soil structure. And um, farmers have been protecting it and cultivating these acacia albida trees for generations. It's actually a traditional practice. So there are quite a few examples like that. This is a more recently developed system. I also have a question for Amber. Amber, I thought uh, your, your work was really interesting, and I got into thinking about some of the political ecological aspects of it. And I was thinking about how, so I do a lot of work on, um, on crop intensification, and you have shown an example of an intensification practice that seems like um, over the long run it will increase the output of agricultural products on the landscape. But at the same time, it's also a system that, according to your findings, looks like is one that um, has a much bigger degree of variance in, in the yield between a drought year and a, a more normal rainfall year. And I was thinking about from the perspective of the, of the landholders themselves, what that kind of variance might mean. And just trying to think about how to, on the one hand, manage for resilience, and on the other hand, manage for um, uh, higher production on the landscape. That's a great question. I don't think I can address it in the time we have, but I'll just say that Keep in mind, this was only one year of data from one experiment. There have been other studies that show that agroforestry systems are have lower yield variability to environmental stresses, depending on the context. So I don't think this should be taken as a general rule. Um, actually, as we speak, my colleagues in Malawi are beginning the maize harvest for this growing season, and we'll see whether it matches last year. <laughs> um, that's an open question. Um, another follow-up to your point is that um, you have to ask what farmers actually care about. Do they care about minimizing variability, or do they care about attaining a certain minimum on, on a regular basis? In the data that I showed, the glaricidia persisted in maintaining a higher minimum than the monoculture, and the variability was in a beneficial direction, right? It was a very, very, uh, very high yield in good years. So, it's a, it's a really important question. What is a farmer's bottom line? What are they trying to maximize? Any other questions? We should probably leave the room for the next people. But if you're, if you're on our mailing list, we're having a potluck next week right. to sort of chat about interactions between our work and get to know each other. So hope to see you there. And thanks, everyone. If you just talked and you haven't signed a release form for the video, they're up here. And other than that, thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, could you make an announcement about a farming-related uh, issue uh, next, um, or this Friday? Uh, Phil McMichael. Phil McMichael will be here from Cornell. He's uh, giving a, a special talk on um, 